Pride. Happy Pride Month, everyone. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, for this is detestable. This passage seems very clear, right? It says that having gay sex is an abomination. Wrong. wondered how someone could believe that homosexual marriage is permitted in scripture with verses like Leviticus chapter 20 verse 13 and Romans chapter 1 that clearly describe engaging in homosexual activities as a sin how do they get around it how could someone hold such a seemingly indefensible view now if you read the title of this video you're probably also wondering how cannibals fit into all of this but to understand that I would encourage you to sit tight and watch the entire video in preparation for this video I've suffered through hours and hours of debates and multiple books by Brendan Robertson since he is a prolific pop theologian on this particular subject. With this, I'm going to try and give you a small glimpse into the minds of those who believe the false worldview that is progressive Christianity. I've had the honor of presiding over a worship service where they came and worshiped with us. Does this seem anti-Christian to you? Just because the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence call out Christian bigotry and hypocrisy doesn't mean that they're anti-Christian. In fact, all Christians should be engaged in calling out the sins of the church. The thumbnail for this video shows Brendan Robertson worshiping alongside the drag queen group, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And in this article, he calls them exemplary Christians and defends their depiction of the crucifixion while a homosexual pole dancer gyrates around the cross as it is performative art and also states that Jesus would have somehow approved of this since Jesus was a performative artist. This is both saddening and obviously designed to denigrate Christianity for sexual perversion. We also see hypocrisy as a common thread for both people like Brendan Robertson and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence as they would never participate in activities where let's say they substitute Jesus for Muhammad and something like this. This hypocrisy is everywhere. Why is it that men usually are the ones dressing as women and not the other way around? Why is it that the vast majority of drag shows are being pushed in front of children instead of the elderly in nursing homes? They prioritize pushing their perverted sexual agenda to the future generations by enticing children down this evil and destructive road. And fresh from spending time praising Sister Roma, that same politician amended a recent bill to make it possible in California for any parent who does not affirm their child's transgenderism to be charged with child abuse. To understand how false teachers sidestep some of the passages that call homosexuality sin, we have to try to back up and understand a little bit more about their worldview as a whole. One of the books that I've read begins by talking about some of the alleged harms of non-inclusive theology. Robertson talks about how a false prophet is known by their fruits, as Jesus says in Matthew. Now, Brendan Robertson writes, Jesus' own life serves an example of what good fruit looks like, standing up for the oppressed, welcoming the marginalized, and healing for those who have been harmed by religious and political powers. But what if a teaching produces death, mental harm, and fear? It seems, following the pattern set forth in the scriptures, that we should condemn this teaching because of its bad fruit, and it should be cut down and thrown into the fire or hastily disregarded as false. So in a way, what Robertson is talking about here sounds good. After all, we could all get behind having less death, mental harm, and fear in the world, right? But let's look a little closer at this for a second. How many people who have a non-inclusive theology have killed someone by their theology? Unless I've been missing some secret church meeting where we sacrifice gay people or we murder them by pushing them off rooftops like they do in the Middle East in the name of Islam, you would be hard pressed to convince me that people are being murdered by those who hold a non-inclusive theology because of their theology. Now, later on in the book, he does talk about the increased suicide rates among the LGBTQ um, individuals um, that grew up in non-inclusive churches. And there is a significant difference in suicide attempt rates between LGBTQ and non-LGBTQ individuals. Robertson writes, while many conservative religious commentators have strongly pushed back against any suggestion that their theology has any actual effect on LGBT plus mental health and suicide rates, and in fact will often use these statistics to suggest that it is not their teachings, but rather the gay lifestyle that contributes to the mental distress of LGBT plus people, these numbers and the experiences of LGBT plus people simply cannot be denied 
or ignored. So let's think about this for a second. We have Brandon Robertson taking this correlation of non-affirming theology and using it to demonstrate a causation for the increased suicide attempt rate. He then criticizes other commentators that say this correlation is caused by their own personal behavior. There's a few really important things to mention here. So first, Correlation is totally different than causation. And one kind of famous example of this is people who drink alcohol are more likely to develop lung cancer than those who don't. The reality is that people who consume alcohol are more likely to smoke, hence the correlation with increased lung cancer. Drinking alcohol doesn't actually increase your risk of lung cancer. It does increase other cancers such as oral, pharynx, larynx, esophageal, stomach, pancreatic, liver, breast, and colorectal cancer, just not lung cancer. Now, another example of this is kind of silly, but it has to do with ice cream. So as ice cream sales increase, so do the number of shark attacks. Does that mean that sharks prefer eating people who eat ice cream? Of course not. The reality is that more people are around to go on the holiday to the beach and buy ice cream, thus increasing the sales, thus increasing the amount of people who are going to go swimming in the water. Now, why is this so important? It's because Brendan Robertson and those like him frequently use data to assert that there is a causation rather than a correlation. And there's a huge difference. And we must make sure that we ourselves aren't guilty of this error, but we must also not be confused by it. Brendan Robertson says that experiences of LGBT plus people cannot be simply denied or ignored. And I don't think it's wise for Christians to take the approach where they deny the significance of the pain that LGBTQ individuals face, whether that's of their own making or not. When Robertson says that they shouldn't be denied or ignored, I want to agree with him. And this is because I do believe many of them have suffered as we live in a fallen world and there's suffering all around us. However, it gets tricky when these same individuals will say that voicing any opposition to their views is somehow equivalent to physical violence. By changing the meaning of the word, in this case violence, it makes discourse in the public square so much more difficult as the word violence doesn't have the same meaning as what it's historically meant. And this seems to be an intentional and manipulative change. There is so much emotional manipulation and lies in these conversations that make it more difficult when you're trying to lovingly show someone the truth. And I think it's very important that in our destruction of the lies and the arguments raised against the knowledge of God, we must see the individual made in the image of God beyond what we see on the surface or what they believe. That doesn't mean that we approve of sin, but like any real love, it will require sacrifice. So let's get back to what Robertson said. He says that bad teaching will lead to death, mental harm, and fear. And I think it's emotionally manipulative when death is paired with mental harm and fear, since they're so different categorically. And I will use a story from my own life as an example to illustrate this. So a few years ago, I was working in a clinic and one of the other dentists that I worked with wanted the last day of the week off because of their mental health. Why? Well, if you asked her, she said she had a very stressful week, which was mostly true, but I'm sure her desire to take the extra day off didn't have anything to do with the fact her boyfriend was going to be coming from out of town and they were already planning what they were going to do uh, over the weekend. But what would happen if she didn't get that mental health day off? off? Would her mind develop, you know, clinical damage from not having the day off? No. Would she immediately commit suicide because her mental health was so bad? Of course not. In this example, we see my colleague talking about her mental health as a sort of independent entity that she gets to assign pseudo clinical conditions to. This is a form of emotional manipulation. It's hijacking clinical words to achieve an agenda. Her agenda was to get the day off and that's exactly what she got. And this is why it's important to examine what someone means by mental harm as Brendan Robertson is saying here. Again, this isn't to say that many LGBTQ people haven't suffered abuse that resulted in mental harm but we must not confuse this with an annoyance or an offense that often masquerades as some sort of clinically irreversible damage. For example, is it mental harm anytime a child is told that they shouldn't get their way all the time? Mental harm, as it were, isn't always to our detriment. A mentally healthy person will experience times of anger, sadness, and even be unwell as part of a life lived fully as a human. Further, a person with good mental health responds to criticism appropriately, considering the source and reflectiveness. An example of this could be someone with an extremely high BMI or body mass index. A BMI of 55 is associated with living about 14 years less than someone with a BMI of 20, and a caring doctor will plan to address this issue even if the patient believes that they are healthy. Similarly, when we see an advertisement campaign against smoking and vaping, and they're talking about the dangers of tobacco, every time 
time you smoke, cigarettes are eating you alive. Smoking eats away at nearly every vital organ and tissue of the body. Cigarettes are eating you alive. Quit smoking today. For help, call 311. The end goal of these ads is to eliminate smoking. However, the process of quitting something like tobacco feels probably like significant mental harm. Ask anybody who's tried to quit. However, the purpose of this temporary suffering will result in better mental health and better overall health. The Journal of World Psychology wrote an article titled Towards a New Definition of Mental Health, and it's a peer-reviewed entry, and it reads, In fact, regarding well-being as a key aspect of mental health is difficult to reconcile with the many challenging life situations in which well-being may even be unhealthy. Most people would consider as mentally unhealthy an individual experiencing a state of well-being while killing several persons during a war action, and would regard a healthy person feeling desperate after being fired from his or her job in a situation in which occupational opportunities are scarce. The current trend instead is to always want people to be happy and to define that as the ultimate goal, even if it ends in the permanent sterilization of children, or more importantly, eternal separation from God. Loving theologians and loving clinicians should always tell the truth. When some people don't get their way and they say that you're inducing some kind of clinical damage to their mental health, they're being manipulative. It's counterproductive and it's ultimately based on lies, and we must not entertain or affirm these lies. The third evidence that Brennan Robertson says is evidence of bad teaching is fear. Now, it seems to me like one would have to be in a rather privileged position to say that bad teaching leads to fear. I mean, tell that to the antelope that's being chased by a cheetah. It goes without saying that fear can be used for evil designs and controlling and manipulating others, but not all fear is evil. Imagine if I as a dentist, went to go see a new patient who's 27 years old and is horrified to see me. You know, they drank soda every day for the past 20 years of their life and their teeth are a mess. Is there fear because of some non-inclusive theology that I have? Is it because of lies they believe or because I have harmed them? Probably not. They are afraid because they know I'm going to tell them the truth, and they may not like the reality of the situation, but they're finally here after years of neglect to do something about it. It would be malpractice for me to tell that patient that their fears are unfounded and tell him that he needs to embrace his rotting, decaying mouth. Also, fear can drive us to have greater characteristics like courage and embrace change. Likewise, it's spiritual malpractice for church leaders to embrace actions that are clearly described as sin in the Bible or to tell of the disease without the cure. Scripture is very clear that the fear of the Lord is a good thing. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in life for a believer. People feel free to sin against him because they ultimately don't think they'll have to suffer any of the consequences of it or because they think they'll never get caught. Now, Deuteronomy chapter 10 reads, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him and hold fast to him. And by his name you shall swear. He is your praise. He is your God. Who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen? God commands the Israelites to fear him. If we sin against him, we will be disciplined. Now, nothing can separate us from his love, and he will never leave us or forsake us, but this holy fear and divine awe and respect acts as a powerful motivator to obey and worship. So how do progressive Christians get around the obvious passages in scripture that talk about homosexuality as a sin? So Robertson himself gives us a little bit of an answer here. He says, as you will see, there are very good reasons to believe that these texts, when understood in their scriptural and cultural context, do not at all apply to the modern conversation about LGBT plus inclusion in the church. However, as we'll explore in significant depth later, the patriarchal worldview that the authors of scripture function within demanded that they condemn all non-heterosexual expression because it fundamentally threatened the ordering of their society. So what you'll see is that the proponents of gay marriage as it were have to jump very obvious truths in the text by various explanations. But all of these explanations fall on a very specific hermeneutic or method by which they interpret scripture. So after discussing some main passages used to show how homosexual activity is a sin, he says this, I don't think we can firmly conclude that the authors of the biblical text would support LGBT plus relationships if they were transported to our modern culture because of 
the apostles' hyperpatriarchal worldview, they condemn such relationships like many non-affirming Christians do today. However, we shall soon see why embracing this patriarchal lens is contrary to the thrust and ethical trajectory of scripture as a whole. So here we see that Brendan Robertson admits the obvious. The apostles not only would not affirm homosexual marriage, but they condemn it by his own admission. The case should be closed, right? Nope, at least not according to him. And I'm gonna read a few longer excerpts here because you really have to see it as he writes it because it gets pretty weird. So later on in the book, he writes, as we examine the biblical trajectory towards inclusion, we begin to see that the primary ethical progression of the biblical arc is away from the patriarchal system that dominated the ancient world towards a more truly egalitarian ordering of society. One of the key reasons that homosexuality was so despised in the ancient world was because it threatened the patriarchal system by causing a man to surrender his rightful place in society and making him act like a woman, which was seen as a fundamental distortion of the ordering of the patriarchal world. In a patriarchal mindset, Sex, gender, and social class are all fundamentally linked, and the cultural dominant man is seen as the ideal human being. But in the face of an oppressive and broken system of social ordering, the Christian faith emerges with a radically countercultural perspective on how the world should be ordered. In the New Testament, we see in the person of Jesus a powerful assault on the patriarchal ordering of his society, elevating the position of women, often treating them as equals, reclining at their tables, and allowing them to be disciples. Jesus' very behavior and social position with within the Roman Empire also would have caused him to be viewed as feminine when contrasted with the citizen men of the Roman Empire. As Diana Swancutt notes in her groundbreaking article, Sexting the Pauline Body of Christ, Jesus and his disciples were girls by Roman gender standards. Now granted, these are selected quotes, but I think they're giving a full picture of what he's really saying here. I think I'm being pretty fair in, in representing what he's saying. But if you thought what he just said was bad, just wait, it gets a lot worse. Another way that the patriarchy symbolically sought to manifest its power was through capital punishment via crucifixion. In the drama of crucifixion, the whole patriarchal system was symbolically coming down upon men who pose as a threat to society, not only by publicly murdering them, but also by emasculating them. Absolutely no other form of death would have been more shameful for a man in a hyper-patriarchal society. In the greco roman world, when Christ is crucified on the cross, he becomes emasculated. The cross is the ultimate expression of power for the patriarchal system in its misogyny, xenophobia, and homophobia. We are almost finished here, I promise. So from the beginning of scripture to the final pages of the book of Revelation, there is a gradual but consistent attack on the systems of oppression, dominance, and exclusion. By fighting patriarchy, exposing it as flawed and a uh, deficient way to order our lives in the world around us, we open the possibility of bringing liberation to both the oppressed and the oppressor. Jesus Christ, in his own body, becomes the literal incarnation of liberation from patriarchy. So, if Jesus was so against the patriarchy, why does he not send his disciples out to dismantle the patriarchy? Just like the last video where we went over what the Bible has to say about demons. The cure for demonic influence in the world is not to cast out demons. It's to spread the good news, the true gospel. If anyone preaches a false gospel, let them be anathema. When we look through the New Testament, do we see that Jesus went after the Roman or the Jewish patriarchy? Or did he go after spiritual pride and hypocrisy? Is patriarchy the reason there are so many atrocities in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament? Is patriarchy the reason that pain exists in the world? Or maybe is it because of sin? Now to answer this, I would like to go to a historical example of my own ancestors in British Columbia. So the Haida people are an indigenous group that occupied much of the coast of British Columbia, and I'm descended partially from them. They were also a matriarchal society, which is why I'm bringing up they were not a patriarchal society. Now, according to Brennan Robertson and woke progressive Christians, this could be a culture that we could potentially emulate, but the reality couldn't be farther from the truth. They were a ferocious people and have been compared to the Vikings by Canadian anthropologist Diamond Genis. They weren't a group of, you know, some noble nature-loving hippies like many of the Native Americans that are so often depicted in modern Western media. 
Now, most of you have probably seen their artwork, the most famous of which is the totem pole. Now, when they would erect these totem poles, they would have a celebration and a feast called a potlatch where they would come together and sometimes kill and sometimes even eat their slaves. And this is a picture of one slave killer club that was used during the ceremony. And this is pretty well documented. They would sometimes throw their slaves into the hole in the ground where the totem pole would eventually be placed before erecting it on top of their slaves' bodies. Why would they do such things? Was it because of the patriarchy? No. Was it because of some white colonizers that taught them how to sin and enslave people? No, they practiced slavery long before any European had settled in the Americas. They even practiced slavery after the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865. It wasn't until 1886 that this slavery would be banned in native lands due to the trial of Saka. Now, Saka was a Haida man who had been captured by the Flathead Indians and was sold into slavery as a child. And from there, he was trafficked up to the Tlingit tribe in Sitka, Alaska. This is a transcript from the proceedings of that trial in 1886. These people are not included within the 13th Amendment to the Constitution and the subsequent legislation by Congress to enforce it. By discussing the amendment and its object, it is necessary to briefly examine the system of slavery among the natives. The object of all intellectual research is the discovery of truth, and unless we open our eyes to observation and disbelieve an unbroken chain of human evidence, we cannot escape the conclusion that slavery, in its most shocking form, has been thoroughly interwoven with with the social policy of the Indians of Alaska and still exists in many localities under circumstances of extreme cruelty. The life of the slave is entirely at the disposal of his master or his mistress and it is customary among them to kill one or more slaves upon the death of the master or on the happening of some other event such as the completion of a new house. Boring the ears or putting out the eye of the slave or some other mode of marking of the flesh has been and is now the custom within some of the families of these people. The evidence shows that the object of such mutilation is to impress upon the slaves their inferiority and render their humiliation complete. The slaves are compelled to submit. Can such a system be tolerated in a country whose people lay claims to civilization and Christianity? Does not every precept of religion, every principle that underlies our system of government, very axiom of our political fabric cry out against such monstrous inhumanity. Now, my point isn't to bash a tribe that I cherish. In fact, I'm very thankful to be Haida. But the reason I bring all of this up is to show that matriarchal societies, in fact, all societies, have systems of oppression, dominance, and exclusion. Doesn't matter if they're patriarchal or matriarchal. For Brendan Robertson to write that Jesus Christ in his own body became the literal incarnation of liberation from patriarchy shows his ignorance of the historical understanding of the cross, history in general, and especially his ignorance regarding matriarchal societies. It was Christianity that changed everything for these tribes. It was Christian influence that abolished slavery in the Americas by Great Britain and the United States. These tribes didn't eat the flesh of their slaves and separate families because of some patriarchal system. It was sin. When Brendan Robertson and those like him look at the Bible, they are reading their own sexual agenda into the text while blatantly ignoring the message and historical context. The patriarchy is not the source of all human wrongs and suffering. Rebellion against God is. There's a reason why God equivocates rebellion with witchcraft in 1 Samuel. It's because we don't understand how evil our sin is. We look at the sins of others with disgust while we enjoy our own secret sins. We can look to depraved ancient cultures that practice slavery and cannibalism, but we are no better in the eyes of God. This is what slave-owning cannibals have to teach Rand Brendan Robertson. There is hope for them. There is also hope for him if he repents. There's hope for anyone who chooses to repent. And that is the true power of the true gospel. Thanks for watching. All Christians should be engaged in calling out the sins of the church.